you got your Bibles, I invite you to turn back to the book of Malachi, chapter 2. Malachi, chapter 2. As you make your way there, we'll return to the Lord in prayer once again. Dear God, we come to you today. We're once again very thankful for the opportunity to come before you. I know this would be a privilege that we take for granted uh, far too often. To, uh, that we fail to understand why it is that we're even able to come boldly before a throne of grace. Uh, that, that you have, have uh, taken our place. That, that you have uh, become that great high priest. That, that you've taken on flesh. That you've become one of us. Uh, that you've lived perfectly. That you might be a, a proper substitute that you might be that great high priest forever, and that you would stand to intercede on our behalf, and that you have gone in uh, within the veil, that you've tore the veil to allow us access in. We're so thankful for the opportunity to pray, the opportunity to learn of your word and to be filled with your spirit. Please help us as we look to your word this afternoon, that, I, uh, that we would have a proper understanding of it, uh, that I, as I would stand to preach, that I would do nothing of my own accord or nothing uh, to, to, to benefit me, uh, but to simply present your holy scriptures as they stand, as they're supposed to be presented and taught. Lord, help us that we can understand your wonderful word that you have blessed us to have. We're thankful that you've given us your word to understand it, uh, that you've not given us some book uh, that, that which could never be understood, that you haven't given us instruction that, that was just going to sail right over our head, but you, you've equipped us with the Holy Spirit to understand your word. And please help us this afternoon. Please help those that may be lost that are here that through the preaching of your word and through the, the, the reading of your scriptures that they could see that they still need a Savior, uh, that, that whatever it is that they may be counting on is not sufficient. And I ask that you would uh, make them very uncomfortable with that fact, that they could come to see a need for a Savior and come to trust you as that Savior. We ask these things in our wonderful and holy name, for you're so worthy. Amen. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 2, we'll begin reading in verse 11. It says, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, and with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, but receiveth it with good will at your hand. We'll stop reading here. Last week we, we covered there in verse 10 in, in which uh, he would ask those series of questions that we had walked through. He'd ask, have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. Uh, and, and as we, we walked through those questions, we, we, we had to establish a couple of facts and that, that all those that are saved, all those that, that are a child of God are exactly that. They are a child of God and God is their father. We all share that Father, and we all share that Creator. We have all been created by Him, and we talked a lot of our relationship with one another and our relationship with God. We said the two are, are tied together and can never be separated. It is impossible to have a proper relationship with God without having a proper relationship with God's people, and vice versa. We can't have a proper relationship with one another Unless our relationship with God is correct. And so we talked about that vertical relationship, your relationship personally with God, and that horizontal relationship, our relationship with one another, and how the two are tied together. We said these next few verses uh, that, uh, that we'll cover this week and, and next week, Lord willing, that this week it really focuses on your personal relationship with God, and then next week we'll circle back around to our relationships with one another and continue to see how they are tied together with one another. Uh, to begin here in verse 11, he would say, Judah hath dealt treacherously. And we talked a lot about that word last week as we came across it in verse 10. That word treacher, uh, treacherous or treacherously, it means to, to break faith. That with one another, horizontally, they had broken faith. They had broken the covenant. That they did not regard one another as them spirit, those spiritual siblings that we had talked about. They... they they uh, regarded themselves to be higher than another. And similarly, they had dealt treacherously with God. They had broken faith with him. They had let him down. We actually read in the book of Psalms how that those that deal treacherously are like a, a broken arrow. I mean, a broken bow. Uh, that as they would reach for it in a time of need, uh, they would go to use it. 
and find that it is of no worth whatsoever. They have broken faith. And so in verse 11, he repeats this, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. It's an abomination. It is, it is a very heinous sin. And it says, For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved. Now, before we can continue with these verses, we'll have to, to uh, dive into to that statement there, to profaning God's holiness. It is to, to kind of uh, render God's holiness useless in a sense. And, and I want to define what I mean by that. Because God is no less holy just because you sin. Uh, there are many people that think that they can get back at God by going and sinning. They think that they, they're mad at God, so they're going to go do all the stuff that God doesn't want them to do just to spite God, just to shake the fist at Him and think that they are actually accomplishing something. We don't hurt God when we sin. We are not doing Him damage by us living unrighteously. Now, does God want us to live righteously? Absolutely. Does, does God have a desire that we that all the world be saved 100%? Does He have a desire that they would live a sanctified life in Him? Absolutely. But it does not. we do not do damage to God's holiness. We do not put a, a chink in His armor, so to speak. We do not do damage to Him as we go and sin. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel 4. And we'll begin reading in verse 30. And now the book of Daniel, we, we talked a little bit about Daniel this morning in, in chapter 3. And in, in the book of Daniel, uh, that the Israelites would be under Babylonian rule to begin with, and eventually they would fall under Persian rule. But at this time, they're still under the Babylonian rule under King Nebuchadnezzar. And in chapter 3, we had uh, we, we talked uh, again this morning about that interaction between Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how that he demanded that they worship him. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the account, uh, which we, we did not go on to read, that uh, whenever the, those three Hebrew boys were, were delivered from the fiery furnace, that Nebuchadnezzar made a decree, and, and he exalted the God of Israel. He exalted the one true living God. And we, we studied, prior to our Malachi study, we studied the book of Habakkuk. And in the book of Habakkuk, we saw very clearly God rose up this nation of Babylon. He used the Chaldeans to accomplish his purpose. In other words, he put them in power. It was nothing that Nebuchadnezzar had done. There was nothing the Babylonians had done. They could not hang their hat on, on their, their own laurels. They, they couldn't uh, boast in themselves. It was God that had risen them up. And God had risen them up for a specific purpose now, Nebuchadnezzar kind of missed this a little bit. It seems as though at one point that he understood it, and now all of a sudden he, he seems to be confused here. And so in Daniel chapter 4, again, we'll pick up in verse 30. It says, The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from me. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall possess over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And so where, where it comes now to Nebuchadnezzar, but prior to this, the Lord had kind of, made, uh, kind of embarrassed Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, kind of made a fool of him openly, so to speak, with the, those three Hebrew men there. And he, as, of course, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he sent out this decree amongst all people. I want us to consider this from Nebuchadnezzar's point of view for a moment. He would send this decree out to the entire empire. And that all those, that they, as they would gather around and see this massive image that he had built, this very expensive image that he had built, and he would have these musicians to play songs. There would be this whole, just about literal, song and dance. This big decree open for all. And he would exert his power over the empire with this. And so these three that would be the only three that, that didn't seem to listen and, and that kind of be an embarrassment a little bit. But Nebuchadnezzar, as we even talked about this morning, that he'd bring them in. 
give him one more chance. He would still be very boastful about it. And he would say, now, if you're ready, at the time that you hear all this music, you worship the, the God, the, the image that I have set up. And he would even ask the question, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? He was very boastful about it. And, and we, we know how the story ends. The Lord delivers those three Hebrews. I would imagine, I, I could not possibly be convinced unless the Lord told me directly that Nebuchadnezzar did that little uh, um, furnace thing in private. I would imagine he, he made this big event and he was showing pretty much all the empire that was around that this is what happens when you rebel against the king. This is the consequence because I have the authority. And he would throw them in and they would walk around and walk out. And that, again, think in terms of Nebuchadnezzar's point of view. How boastful he had been, how arrogant he had been, and how little God had made him right then. So much so that he'd made a decree that none should defile that God. And so time goes on. And time goes on. And Nebuchadnezzar has some success. And he's looking out over his empire. And he says in verse 30, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? I've got to imagine he was a little bit bitter in saying this. I've got to imagine that as time would go on that, that he would... Uh, feel a little bit bitter towards the, the, this God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this Hebrew God that had made an embarrassment of him. And time goes on, and he gets some success, and he starts to convince himself once again, yes, I'm the one that's built this. I'm the one that's done all of this. And it is as though he's trying to, in my opinion, do some sort of damage to God, that he is trying to be prideful and arrogant and disregard God, thinking he's accomplishing something by this. And God would as we, we know the rest of this story, that God would have Nebuchadnezzar uh, crawling around in a field eating grass, uh, acting, it's, it's talks of how his, his, his nails would grow out and he would be unshaven and he, he would be uh, wet with the dew and his hairs were grown and, and he, he would just be just ragged and like a beast. That God would literally make him to be as a beast of the field to humiliate him just to get this message across. I do what I want to do. That's what he says there in verse thir- at the end of verse 32. Until you know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. You see, if we want to go out and to accomplish some sort of damage to God, it can, it's impossible. It is impossible for us to be prideful or sinful enough to, to actually do damage to God's holiness. So what does he mean when he says in Malachi that Judah had profaned the holiness of the Lord. Well, I think we can take a look at this in two different ways. In one sense, Israel had profaned the holiness before the world. That, that they have, this, this is a very holy God, a very jealous God. God made that a point, not, not the petty jealousy that, that we've got, but a God who has a rightful place over Israel, he has, a right, he has a right to her and has claimed that right. It is in the same sense that those who are married, uh, that, that I, in, a, in a healthy way, I can be jealous over my wife, not in the sense that any, any man that walks by and, and it says, hey, how's it going, that, that I, I get the right to just go be upset about it, but in the sense that this relationship is exclusive. She belongs to me and to nobody else, and vice versa. She is jealous over me that if I were to go around and to have an affair with her, that she has a right to be upset. She has a right, a right over me. And God has this right over his people. He owns his people. He is the master. He is the father. He's the creator. He has a right over his people. And when his people rebel, that's what it means when he says he's a jealous God. He's a holy God, righteous, perfect, perfectly just. And so whenever we as his people who walk about and proclaiming God is a jealous God. God is my Father. Uh, we, we like to uh, rest in some of those good promises, and rightfully so. When we talk about the church being His bride, much is made of, of this relationship. There's a lot of celebrating in it, a lot of talking about it, but then we turn around, and in the very next breath, we live as though that there is no God at all. That, that we, it, As it says in the psalm, the fool says, in his heart there is no God. In our heart, our actions do not reflect the fact 
that we are servants of this holy God, that in our hearts, that, that it does not reflect the, the facts that God is the, the one who is the, the bar for righteousness, that He sets the standard for what is moral, that He calls the shots, and we go about and we just live as though that He doesn't even exist. And in doing this, this would, would profane the holiness of God before the whole world, that they look to us, they look to the word that we claim is perfect and right. They look to the message that we proclaim. They look to the songs that we sing and they see this image of God and then they look to his people and they say, well, there's a disconnect here. Obviously, this God does not matter whatsoever. There was, uh, I think we actually, in a really weird way, uh, we, I think we, we read of Gandhi this morning and I believe it was Gandhi that had made the statement that, uh, that he had in looking at the writings of Jesus, he made the statement, I like Jesus, uh, don't really like Christians. <laughs> that he had liked the, the philosophy of Christ, he had liked the message of Christ, the selflessness of Christ, but then he looked to those that proclaimed to be a child of God and saw that there was something very different. Now, this isn't an excuse for Gandhi to have not been a Christian. Gandhi still going to be uh, held accountable, but he, he makes a point here. But that disconnect, it, it reveals to the world this God that's so holy, he doesn't seem so holy to me anymore. It damages him in their eyes. Uh, turn with me to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. read verse 14. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 19, verse 14. It says, And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And, the morning, and when the morning arose, then the angel hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Now, this would be at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot would be a relative of Abraham's. And prior to this, that, uh, that it says that they, they grew too much, that the land couldn't sustain them. And so Abraham and Lot decided to part ways and very respectfully, no love lost. And, and Abraham would tell Lot, you pick a direction you want to go and I'll go the other. <clears throat> and, and it would say that Lot chose the well-watered plains of Jordan and pitched his tent toward Sodom. And that Abraham went the opposite way. Well, it comes over time, and, and God's Word reveals that it seems as though that Lot went from pitching his tent towards Sodom uh, to being a leader within the city. And, and for those that may not be familiar, Sodom and Gomorrah are, are a, just the picture of the, some of the most vile and disgusting uh, civilizations to have ever existed. Uh, that, that it is kind of a, a synonym for just that which is the most wicked thing we could think of. And I would imagine that as Lot was with Abraham, uh, that, that Lot thought very highly of God. And that he probably lived as though he thought very highly of God. And we get to the New Testament, it talks about his righteous soul being vexed daily. It seems as though that he had had faith in God and that he pitched his tent towards Sodom and, and time goes on and now all of a sudden he's in Sodom and living in Sodom. And, and it seems as though that he's a ruler in Sodom. He's very much invested now. And God would come to him by Abraham's request and say, you know, oh, let's get out of this city because God's destroying it. And he, he, he goes and he gets his two daughters and he gets his wife and he gets his sons-in-law, those that his daughters had married. And he comes with his message in verse 14. Up, oh, get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. Why is it that God was destroying the city? Because God's a holy God and the city is very, very wicked. It seems as though that all of a sudden Lot's coming and he has this high sense of morality. He has this high sense of God's holiness and his judgment. But it says at the end of verse 14, but he seemed as one that mocked to his sons-in-law. That his sons-in-law, they had, they had known, they knew Lot. That was her Paul-in-law. And I said, well, what in the world are you, Lot, what are you talking about? Well, you've never, I'd imagine that this might have even been the first time they had even heard of this guy coming out of Lot's mouth. And they thought that he was joking. And he was this one who joked to them. Ha ha, very funny. And they, they went on. We read the next verse that, that in verse 15, when the morning arose, says that he 
the angel said, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters. We don't see any sons-in-law in that verse. That the sons-in-law didn't heed the warning. They, they didn't see a need to. And it was because of Lot's just degradation. It was because that he had really abandoned God altogether. He didn't view him as holy. He didn't act as though God was holy. He was acting just like everybody else. And because he was acting just like everybody else, the message had no effect whatsoever. See, all that prior stuff that Lot had done, whenever he was with Abraham and was likely faithful to God, I, 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 I get that because of that New Testament verse that talked about his righteous soul. Obviously, at some point he had faith, otherwise his soul would not be righteous, that he had the righteousness of God. So at some point he was faithful, but that didn't matter anymore. It had no effect. And, and, and God's people, we do this a lot. We live in our past accomplishments. That one time we were really spiritual, that one time in which we cared a lot about the, the, the Lord, we cared a lot about the work, we look back to some things that we did, and although our life doesn't reflect it anymore, we kind of say, well, you know, at least at one point I did something. Well, that, that didn't matter anymore. That, that, uh, that accomplished absolutely nothing here in Genesis 19. And in this sense, that living in sin, living treacherously, breaking that covenant with God, that it profaned God's holiness to these people. That they didn't see a holy God anymore. They said, well, if, if Lot's a servant of this God, I think I'm good to go. We also, I think we can understand it, is whenever we sin, we actually profane God's holiness to ourselves. We trick ourselves into thinking that God has a lower standard than what he does. We convince ourselves that it's okay. So the more we sin, as you go, and you may have experienced this, if you go and you sin, it might eat you up. And then you sin again, and it, it just it really bothers you. And you sin again, and it keeps bothering you. And eventually, it just really doesn't bother you anymore. Eventually, you've hardened your own heart. You've stiffened your own neck, and you've rebelled. And, and, and what you have done is, in your own eyes, profaned the Lord's holiness. We, we've read of this recently. I believe it's Psalm 50, if I'm not mistaken. In which God says that you thought that, in my own words, that God would tell these people that were rebellious and wicked, he said that you thought that I was just like you. You thought that because the, that they, they were living wickedly and nothing really bad was going on, and so they had thought, well, God's just like us. He's, all right. He's got the same sense of, of <clears throat> morality that we've got. And the God says, not so. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. I've been talking too much today. Uh, back in Malachi... In chapter 3, we actually see a good example of this. And we'll cover this more in detail as, as we get there. <clears throat> Y'all really ought not to let me talk this much on a Sunday. Malachi chapter 3. <clears throat> Verse 13. It says, Your words have been stout against me saith the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken so much against thee? It's Malachi chapter 3. I don't know if I've said that. Uh, Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Verse 14. Ye have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? We now And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. And they that tempt God are even delivered. This, this state here, <clears throat> this state of mind they have found themselves in, that at one point, and we read of this as they were rebuilding the temple and that they were uh, reestablishing the offerings, that things were looking pretty good and, and there was a lot of rejoicing. And, and, but, but over time, that the offerings began to slip. That the unblemished, they said, well, it's okay if we offer the lame and the sick. And, and they began to pollute everything. That, that They were just going through the motions. And, and that, in their mind, it, it began to degrade God's holiness. At one point, there was a very high view of God, an extremely high view of God. God is, at one point in their society, God was to be feared. That they could think back to, to possibly Nadab and Abihu. 
uh, the, the sons of Aaron as they would offer up strange fire for the Lord and they were killed. There was a, a, a legitimate fear of God. This is the standard of holiness. And they could go to, to whenever David would have the Ark of the Covenant uh, to come back and, and the, the Ark of the Covenant would rock. And, and, of course, I can't think of his name now. I had it just a second ago. So he'd place his hand on there that he would drop dead. And, and that it really upset David. It, it really put a fear in the people that there was a high view of God. This God, he has a holy standard and he, does, he expects it to be met. He does not expect it to be tinkered with. And the, their offerings as they, as they rebuilt the temple, it reflected that. They were offerings that were pleasing to God. God was very well pleased with his people. But then that view of God fell away. And as the view of God fell away, the offerings fell away. And as the offerings fell away, they came back in here in chapter 3. It says that they have spoke uh, stout against the Lord. And they have said it is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? They hadn't even kept his ordinance. They had just gone through the motion of his ordinance. And they said, what profit is it? We have, what profit is that we've walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And it got to the point in verse 15 that they called the proud happy. And they that work wickedness were set up. And they that tempt God are delivered. This was their mindset, a very similar mindset to what we read in Psalm 73 this morning of Asaph. And, and what happened is, again, their sins crept in. And in their mind, God was now less holy than what he actually was. And in that sense, they profane God's holiness to themselves. Living in sin tricks us into thinking God has lost his holiness. And he never has. And he never will. <clears throat> in, in verse 11, it says, that Profane the holiness of the Lord, which he loved. Uh, and, and, and at the end of the verse, it says, that It hath married the daughter of a strange God. Now, turn with me to Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. And those who are like me and always want Ezra to be at the end of the Old Testament, it is not for the book of Psalms. It is actually kind of on the first half there. Ezra chapter 9. I think that, <clears throat> that phrase there can be taken in multiple ways, marrying the daughters of the strange God. Uh, for one, we see, and we'll look more at this next week, something that they were actually doing was divorcing their wives and marrying across culture. Uh, and what this results in, there, there's really a, a lot of confusion surrounding this a lot of times, uh, that, that God decreed that, that the Jews marry the Jews. And he did not do this because he didn't like other people. Uh, he didn't do this. This really had nothing to do with race. As a matter of fact, the other people, the, the Moabs, they were really the same race. It was kind of the same genealogy. It all kind of tra they all lived in the same area, and they were all kind of really related. It had everything to do with their worship of God. It had everything to do with their society and the way it was structured, and that God did not want them to creep over into, uh, into idolatry. We see actually the book of Ruth, that Ruth, was one of those people that God demanded that they not marry. But Ruth came over, she became a Jew, and she began to worship God, and she married Boaz, and the Lord was very well pleased with that marriage. It's actually established kind of as an ideal marriage in the Old Testament. And so what they were doing in marrying the daughter of this strange God, they were marrying across culture, and they were bringing the culture of the world in to the worship of God. And in Ezra chapter 9, this is spelled out very clearly, verse 1, it says, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Ammonites, and the Moabites, and the Egyptians, and the Amorites. And they have taken their daughters for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands, Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. This cross-marriage of culture, we'll get more on the horizontal aspect of that uh, next week, Lord willing, but it affected their worship of God. Because now there was all these extra cultures creeping, there was all these other gods, this, all this other idolatry that began to come in, and they began to integrate all of it into this unholy 
mess into this thing in which they, they didn't outright reject God. They didn't outright reject their system of worship, but they just took pieces of other religions and crammed it in place, and it just made this big, nasty stew of filth. And it said, I love how it's worded here in verse 1, but it says that the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves. They had not separated themselves. They had failed to be sanctified. And they took what God, God set up worship very specifically in a very specific way to be performed with a very specific heart. And they had pretty much taken every bit of that and thrown it into the trash. He says, we worship God. Our worship of God should not reflect anything that the world values. The, the worship of God should not reflect worldly worship. And I'm going to define what I mean by that because I think that gets taken too far in a lot of different ways. There are those that, that they will uh, go out and die on this limb of, of certain types of music that may get sung or certain type of this or certain type of uh, different ways of, of doing things. And believe me, I've got my preferences and my preferences are the way that, that we do it. But what I mean by this, it doesn't really matter what a, what a song sounds like. What matters is the content, and the content of worldly worship is to worship yourself. That's what the world cares about, is, is uplifting me. It is very self-centered, very man-centered worship. And there's a lot that has crept into modern Christianity and modern worship music and modern prayers and modern living that is man-centered, that it feeds into me. That's what these other religions did. They established some types of worship that are, uh, if uh, I'd be a little embarrassed to even talk about it. I, I'd be embarrassed to go into detail as to some of the things that they would do. Uh, some of them, in, in a general sense, uh, they would establish some temple prostitutes to go and worship. That's disgusting. That They would go, and you see in the New Testament this warning against drunkenness, and such. A, there, there, there's that warning for multiple different reasons. Don't get drunk. But also in context of the New Testament, that it was th that drunkenness was used in combination with such temples to worship. And what we find is their worship looked a lot like what man wants. It looks a lot like what they desire, drunkenness and filth and sin. And so they did all of these things and they said, well, we're going to, this is how we're going to worship God. And so then they turned it into some sort of form of worship, even though they were just doing what they wanted to do. This is what the world does. The world worships in the sense of how that they of the things that they want, but God has deemed His worship specifically. Our worship of God has to have the primary importance is a high view of God, God as holy, God as the one that receives glory, not me. It is God that is magnified, not me. This is extremely important. Also, worship has to reflect truth. We have there in John 4 that they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. Worship has to contain truth. Worship has to have a very high view of God. That is why it is sanctified. It is separated. It is different from what the world longs for. Not that we have to establish a an exact specific sound for our music. That way it's different than worldly music. God made music. Music is music. What it means is that it is de deliberately focused on God and God alone, on magnifying Him and Him alone. There in, in Malachi in chapter 2 and verse 12, it says that the Lord will cut off the man that, do, that doeth this, the master and the scholar out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. So it has now uh, this, this uh, cutting off the man that... It, commits these abominations. Cutting off the men out of the tabernacles of Jacob, it is saying that it is almost a, a withdrawing of fellowship from God. And it says, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. That's strange. You see, it, obviously they had sin. There was obviously sin going on. But God established the offerings because they sinned. Remember, that's the whole point of sacrifice, that they take the animal, they commit, they've committed a sin, they have broken the covenant, they bring a sacrifice, they do the sacrifice, it atones for their sin. So God established the sacrificial system because they were sinful. So why does their sin 
make God reject the sacrifice. It doesn't really make sense at a face value, but we find that the answer is quite simple, that the Lord established this system to, be, to, to take place under a certain heart, under a certain condition. We looked, I believe, last Sunday morning at repentance, at what repentance is. That repentance is 100% results-based. We can't go and talk about, how, oh, how sorry I am, oh, how sad I am, Lord, I've messed up, and there'd be no change whatsoever. That's not repentance, and that's what the people were doing. They were sinning and sinning and sinning, and they were just killing blind animals, deaf animals. They were killing all these things, and God rejected it, one, because the offerings were not correct, but two, because the heart was not correct. This is why in Psalm 51, David would write uh, that, 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 in my own words, an offering would be totally useless. A broken and contrite heart thou won't despise. He says, then I'll offer. Then I will bring these offerings. Turn with me to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Verse 1. <clears throat> Matthew 15 and verse 1. It says, then came, Jesus, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do these disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition, ye hypocrites. Well did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men." And so these scribes and Pharisees, they come to, to, to Jesus and they're complaining because Jesus and his disciples don't wash their hands. And it's not the same kind of complaints that we would make. It was a ceremonial washing that just in case they had accidentally, unbeknownst to them, touched something that is ceremonially unclean, that just to make sure, I don't think I did, but just to make sure they, they washed their hands every time they dipped their hands in water before they eat, just in case. And they were very strict about this. Doing that, not really a problem. God, Christ here, he didn't really have a problem with them dipping their hands in water. But the Pharisees and the scribes had a problem because Jesus didn't. And so they come to him and they ask him this, and they say, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? And Christ's response to them is, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Why are you trespassing the commandment of God through your, your vain traditions that you go and do. Now, the problem wasn't the tradition. The problem was their, their, their mindset behind it, that it was now all of a sudden a requirement. It was now all of a sudden it was a standard of God's Word. And also, he would go on and he would point to an example. And he would say, the, you know, God commanded, honor thy father and thy mother. It's in the commandments. It's the first commandment with promise. And he says, and he points to them and he says, but you don't do that. He says, but you say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. So God says, honor your father and your mother. And the Pharisees, that their father and mother, they have need of something. The Pharisees, no, I can't give it to you. I've got to give it to God. I have to give it, so I can't help you out. And it says that in doing that, one, they're not honoring their father and mother, and then they go on and they say, well, we're free because we're giving it to God. It's a gift. It's a gift to God. I can't give it to you. But their the little tradition that they just made, they had come up with this tradition, it stood in the way of the actual commandments. And so with their mouth, they're thinking, well, I'm giving a gift to God. With their mouth, they're drawing near to him. With their mouth, they're pleasing God. And he says, well, did, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you that you draw near with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. Well, we see the very same heart reflected in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, uh, at the, the letter to the church of Ephesus, that they had, uh, they had done many good works and in his name done many wonderful things. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. 
those false teachers. They did all these things right, but it says that you've left your first love. That they, at one point, that they were doing it because they had loved Christ. And they clung to Him, but now all of a sudden they did it just to do it. It's just because that's what we do. And they had uh, totally abandoned Him. It was not the issue of the sacrifice. Well, in Malachi, that their sacrifices were wrong. Uh, that they weren't offering the right things. But the greater issue was the condition of the heart. That they had drew near to God with their mouth. They said, it is vain that we have mourned before you. It is vain that we have kept the commandments. And they didn't do any of those things. They didn't keep the ordinances. They didn't really even mourn. They had just drew near with their mouth, but their heart was very far from God. And because their heart was far from God, God rejected the sacrifices for sin. It would say also in the next verse, that and in verse 13, and this you have done again, or, or, and this you have also done. He, he comes up with, he brings up something else that they're doing. So they're, co- they're covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receive it with good will at your hand. So God is rejecting the offering, and he says, and now you're covering the altar with your tears. But God doesn't accept sorrow either. And, and you may say to me, but I thought you said it was a condition of the heart, so if they're sorrowful, why doesn't that result in anything? Well, we read last Sunday there in, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians, uh, in which Paul had talked about the letter that he had written to them before and how that it had caused them sorrow, and that made Paul rejoice. It made Paul rejoice, not that they were sad, not that they were sorrowful, but that they were sorrowful unto repentance. So, so the sorrow of the world works death. The sorrow of the world is meaningless. But a sorrow that takes root in you and that causes a change that is a good thing. See, this sorrow, it caused no change. They just wept. They, they had, God did not accept the sacrifice, and God did not accept their emotions either. Those emotions never bridged the gap. And, and, and we looked, I mentioned that church of Ephesus, they had left their first love. We read there in Matthew 15 how the, the, the Isaiah had prophet, well had Isaiah prophesied of them. They drew near with their mouth, but their heart was far from them. And so you say, well, what do you mean emotions don't, don't, don't accomplish anything? It says it doesn't. Well, no, it doesn't. Our, our, our love, is, love is not represented as an emotion whatsoever. A love is totally untied to emotion entirely. Love would be an action. Love is that in which you place another above yourself regardless of how you feel about it, regardless of what benefits it does or does not bring to you. That's where the world falls short. You, you hear people all the time talk. Somebody will ask, have you ever been in love with somebody? Uh, well, yeah, but I'm not anymore. Well, that's not how love works. You know, love, as a matter of fact, that in 1 Corinthians 13, that the Word of God defines that love never fails. Never. Love never fails. It never puffs itself up. Love is in the, not in the least bit concerned about yourself. It has nothing to do with you. Love has everything to do with the other person. And so their love of God had failed. Not the emotion of love, not good feelings. Their, their sorrow, it was sorrow that was brought about because God wasn't accepting the sacrifices. And it was sorrow that was brought about because they weren't receiving benefits anymore. And so God doesn't accept that sorrow. God doesn't accept that sacrifice. We can actually get a really good comparison of, uh, of what it ought to be by the verses we read this morning. In Luke chapter 5, you'd recall that as, as Peter, they had the, the rough night of fishing and the Lord will bless them with the fish. And it says that Peter went to Christ and was, he said, depart from me. I'm a worker of iniquity. Depart from me. That, that he, he had this, all of a sudden, this idea, I'm not worthy of the presence of God anymore. Their idea was different. Their idea, they were so sorrowful because they thought that they were worthy of God forgiving them. They thought that they had earned something through their sacrifice. They thought they had earned something through their sorrow. Peter realized that he was worthy of nothing. And that he had sorrow too. But we see the sorrows are very different. Peter had sorrow because there was some sort of condition in his heart that, that he had come to realize that this is a righteous man. This is a holy man and, and I am not that. I'm not worthy of him. And we see a, a very different idea. They're, they're, the, the tears and sorrow represented in Malachi, they were just an emotional result of their self-love, not a love of God. And so as we, we come to the, the end of these verses here, um, and we'll, I, as I said, next week we'll look more at the, the, 
horizontal relationship, but before we get to that, uh, may we all come to actually love God. Not just feel good sometimes, be sorry that uh, some other times, not offer up vain sacrifices, not profane His holiness, but love the Lord, love His Word, love His law and His commandments and His statutes. And that will take care of our vertical relationship with Him. And as we take care of that, our horizontal relationships begin to come in line. We'll look more at that next week. This will be the message. We'll offer a verse of invitation.